Hello everyone, today's topic is going to be vectors and scalars. Now, <clears throat> there are two types of physical quantities, scalars and vectors. Uh, in fact, there are three, there's a third kind uh, and those are called tensors, but uh, we're not really going there. In, in this video, we're going to be talking about scalars and vectors only and primarily about vectors. See, <clears throat> the two kinds of scale, uh, physical quantities, scalars and vectors, uh, have slightly different properties, different, slightly different requirements for their algebra. <clears throat> And that's the topic of uh, discussion today. Yes. Now, scalars are those physical quantities which generally do not require specification of direction for their complete description. Now, I say generally because there are exceptions to the rule, uh, like, for instance, electric current, which is classified as a scalar, uh, in spite of the fact that it does have a direction. Now, <clears throat> scalars, as I said, are quantities which do not generally require uh, direction for their complete description. And their algebra is very simple. They just follow the normal rules of algebra uh, that numbers follow. So they can be added, subtracted, divided, multiplied, like normal numbers. And therefore, there is nothing special to learn uh, about the algebra of scalars. What we do need to learn more uh, specifically about is the algebra of quantities called vectors. Now, <coughs> vectors generally require direction, in fact, always require direction for their complete specification. We cannot describe a vector without uh, describing its direction. So vectors have magnitudes, just like scalars, and they also have directions. And the directions need to be specified for their complete description. Also, to be called a vector, a quantity needs to be, uh, <clears throat> needs to, you know, have, needs to follow the laws of vector algebra to be, to be called a vector. You cannot call a quantity a vector just because it has magnitude and direction. To be called a vector, there is a third qualification, and that is the quantity has to follow the special rules of algebra, those have been which have been laid down for vectors. Now, the common examples of vectors are displacements, velocities, acceleration, force, etc. All these are quantities which possess direction. Also, they do follow the special rules of vector algebra and, and those are the rules that we are going to be discussing in today's video. Now, first things first, how do we represent vectors? Now, uh, look at the figure there uh, where, where we're talking about representation of vectors. Uh, think of little Chintu there in the green color, the, the green colored little chap there. Uh, he walks from point P to point Q. And as Chintu walks from point P to point Q, uh, he goes through a displacement. Now, we all know displacement is a vector that we draw from the initial point, initial position of motion to the final position of motion. So we draw a vector from point P to point Q. And this vector uh, represent. We, we draw a arrow from point P to point Q and this arrow represents his displacement vector. So vectors are represented by arrows as you can easily see over here. Vectors are represented by arrows. Arrows that start at uh, a point of origin and terminate at a point of uh, termination of final point, let's say. Uh, <clears throat> now, displacement is the best sort of example to use for the study of vectors, simply because uh, displacements have a very geometric aspect to them. They're simply uh, 
visually represented by arrows and th therefore we'll be talking about displacements quite a bit in, in this video. Now, <clears throat> what we also do here is, is a kind of scaling process. Now the length of this vector arrow represents the magnitude of the vector. But obviously, if Chintu walks four kilometers, we cannot draw four kilometers in our notebook uh, or in our textbook. And therefore, we do scaling. So uh, we say that each centimeter here represents uh, one kilometer and we draw a four centimeter long vector from P to Q, representing the displacement that uh, our friend Chintu there uh, goes through. <clears throat> now, that's the uh, geometric representation. Now we can also represent vectors in text, you know, when we, when we need to refer to vectors in our speech or in text, we, we represent them by letters of the alphabet. They may be capital letters or lowercase letters. Uh, these letters have an arrow uh, made on top of them so as to indicate that they are representing vectors or they are printed in bold fonts. So. Generally, in books, vectors are represented in bold fonts, uh, whereas in handwritten text, we, we prefer the first approach where we have an arrow on top of a letter of the alphabet to refer to vectors. When we refer to the magnitudes of vectors in text, we just write the same uh, letter of the alphabet without the arrow on top without any bold printing and then that represents the magnitude or the length of the vector. Now, <clears throat> there, are, there are certain very important things that we need to learn about vectors and these important points we'll be talking about first and then we'll be talking about addition and subtraction of vectors, the algebra of vectors. Now, the first thing you need to understand is that vectors can easily be redrawn at new uh, locations. You know, you have a vector A there. You can you can see that right underneath uh, me. There's a vector A and I have redrawn vector A at a new location. And it still remains the same vector A because it has the same magnitude, same length and the same direction. It's drawn parallel, right? So uh, two parallel lines obviously have same direction. And therefore, these two vectors are the same vector A. Then, <clears throat> what's negative of a vector? Now, negative of a vector is a vector of the same magnitude, but having the exact opposite direction. So, you can see here, in, in the figure in the middle here, right, right underneath me, uh, there is a vector A drawn and vector minus A has exactly the same length, the same magnitude and the opposite direction. So <clears throat> vectors which have uh, same magnitude but are exactly opposite in direction are negative of each other. And then we talk about what are called unit vectors. Now uh, a unit vector is a vector of unit magnitude but uh, has no dimensions, no units. Why? Because a unit vector is a vector divided by its own magnitude. And when we divide a vector by its own magnitude, the units cancel out and we have a unitless quantity, uh, which is used for purely representing direction. Uh, <clears throat> these unit vectors only represent uh, directions they, they they do not have any units and uh, later on you will see that we use these for representing uh, directions so unit vectors have a cap placed on top of them you know you see that little cap on top of a the unit vector a cap uh, this a cap represents a unit vector which is in the same direction as vector a but has a unit vector, unit magnitude and has uh, no unit, right? So these, these are a couple of important points about vectors. We need to discuss uh, perhaps a couple more uh, <clears throat> and we'll be going through them as and when the need arises. Uh, <clears throat> also, unit vectors along x, y and z directions uh, 
are represented as i cap j cap and k cap respectively so a unit vector along x axis direction is i cap a unit vector in y direction is j cap and a unit vector in z direction is k cap similarly minus i cap would be a unit vector in negative x direction minus j cap in negative y direction and minus k cap in negative z direction now <coughs> Vectors are now easily represented by multiplying a magnitude with a unit vector. You know, for instance, uh, let's let's consider a vector of uh, a displacement vector of four kilometer in the negative x axis direction. Now, the magnitude is four and the direction is negative x. Now, in negative x, a unit vector is represented as minus i cap so this vector can be easily represented as four times minus i cap so this displacement vector a is four times minus i cap or minus uh, four i cap so uh, that's how we represent uh, vectors we just multiply their magnitudes with unit vectors in the direction of those vectors now <coughs> Another very important thing we need to understand really well is uh, how to determine the angle between two vectors. Now, the angle between two vectors is the smaller one of the two angles between the vectors, uh, between their tails actually. So, <clears throat> if you are to determine the angle between two vectors, uh, make them in such a manner, draw them in such a manner that their tails are at the same point with the heads pointing away from the common point. Uh, draw them such that their tails meet at a point. Now where, where their tails meet, there are two angles between them, uh, the larger one and the smaller one. The correct angle between two vectors is the smaller one of the two angles. Uh, now, if the vectors are drawn, as in the lower figure, uh, with the, the head of A uh, meeting the tail of B, you know, the tail of B starts at the head of A in the lower figure there. And uh, in this kind of a scenario, you cannot determine the angle between two vectors because their one, one of their heads is meeting the tail of the other vector. Uh, you cannot determine the, the angle between them. What you need to then do is redraw vector A such that it originates from the tail of vector B and then find the angle between them. So uh, you can easily see that I have drawn uh, vector A again as a dashed uh, line segment with an arrow and then I have taken the angle uh, between A and B in this uh, diagram quite easily seen there. Uh, <coughs> now once we are equipped with this basic information uh, what we will be doing is uh, we'll be adding we'll be learning to add vectors now addition of vectors is purely a geometric process in, in adding vectors we do not uh, just add them or subtract them like numbers vectors are added in a geometric process now let me explain uh, again, uh, we, we meet our little friend Chintu there in, in, in green color. He starts off at point P and uh, walks all the way up to point Q, uh, producing a displacement vector A. Now he then walks from point Q to point R, uh, producing another displacement vector B. Now, <coughs> in, in the diagram here, in this triangle uh, that you can see, the tail of vector B starts off at the head of vector A. Now, starting at P, Chintu first reaches Q, producing a displacement vector A, and then from Q, Chintu reaches up to point R, producing a displacement vector B. The end result is that he has reached from P to Q, producing a uh, a resulting displacement vector C. So he's reached from P to R actually. So he's reached from P to R 
uh, and uh, the resultant or the result of his two displacements is vector c now this vector c uh, i have called it so far i have called it uh, resultant of vectors a and b now this resultant you know this is the result of those two displacements this resultant is called the vector sum of a and b so the resultant of two vectors is their vector sum right so <clears throat> what you can see now is a triangular figure and in this triangular figure uh, vector c is the resultant of vectors a and b it is therefore now defined as the sum of a and b now, since the diagram uh, that we have drawn is a triangle, this law of vector addition is called the triangle law. Now, if we are adding vectors A and B uh, with the head, with the tail of B starting off at the head of A at point Q, then a vector drawn from the tail of vector A to the head of vector B is the vector sum of A and B. This is the triangle law of vector addition. Now, uh, the triangle law is, you know, also sometimes described as a parallelogram law. Uh, now, the new figure you are seeing towards my right, uh, the same vectors A and B have been drawn and their vector sum A plus B is drawn as vector C in blue color there and uh, <clears throat> what I've also done is I have drawn vector B at the tail at the starting point of vector A at the initial point of vector A and then at the head of this newly drawn vector B I have drawn vector A again producing a parallelogram. Now what you can see is that the diagonal of the parallelogram represents our vector sum of A and B. Uh, therefore, uh, this triangle law is uh, also often described as uh, the law of vector addition. So, uh, triangle law uh, or the parallelogram law is really the same thing. There is no difference here. Both these laws are uh, pretty much identical. Now, what we will be uh, doing is we'll be determining the magnitude of vector C. Given that the magnitudes of A and B are known, we'll be determining the magnitudes of vector. We'll be determining the magnitude of vector C from the known magnitudes of A and B and the known angle theta between A and B. Now, <clears throat> have a look here. Uh, what I have done is from point R, I have drawn a perpendicular on the extended line representing vector A. So I have extended vector A uh, from its head and then I have dropped the perpendicular from R on that extension, uh, resulting in two uh, lines having lengths X and Y as you can see in this uh, figure. Now when you divide uh, this X by the length B or X when you divide X by the magnitude of vector B uh, you should be getting cos theta and therefore X equals uh, B cos theta and Y equals uh, B sine theta right and now we have a large uh, right angled triangle PQR you can see this large right angled triangle PQR uh, in this triangle PQR the vector C, the resultant of vectors A and B is the hypotenuse and we'll be determining the the length of this uh, hypotenuse. We'll also be determining the direction by determining the angle epsilon shown in this figure. Now to determine the uh, magnitude of C, you can easily see that the length of C, that is the magnitude of C uh, when squared equals A plus X whole square plus Y square as per our friendly friendly neighborhood Pythagoras theorem. So C square equals A plus X whole square plus Y square. Uh, C square therefore equals A plus B cos theta whole square plus B sine theta square, B sine theta whole square. Uh, 
uh, after some tiny amounts of simplification, you know, uh, we end up with c square equals a square plus b square plus 2 ab cos theta. I've shown these calculations. You can uh, pause the video and have a look at these calculations. There's a like, slight bit of simplification done there. Uh, and we end up with the result c square equals a square plus b square plus 2 ab cos theta. And that's the result we will be using for calculating the magnitude of uh, the resultant of two vectors a and b. So if we have two vectors a and b having magnitudes a and b and uh, the angle between them is theta, the magnitude of the resultant c is given by this result here. c square equals a square plus b square plus 2ab cos theta. Now to determine the direction of C, uh, that is to determine the angle epsilon, what we do is we determine tan of epsilon and tan of epsilon uh, will be equaling B sine, look at the right angled triangle there, B sine theta divided by A plus B cos theta or rather Y by A plus X. And uh, this easily gives us tan epsilon equal to B sine theta by A plus b cos theta. So this way we can easily determine the magnitude as well as the direction of this resultant vector. Uh, let's have uh, one simple example. Uh, let's consider two forces of magnitude 10 newton each which act at a point uh, on a body at an angle of 60 degrees to each other. What is the uh, their resultant? What's the magnitude of the resultant? What's the direction of their resultant? Now. Uh, look at the diagram below. We have two forces of 10 Newton each and the angle uh, between them that 60 degrees is also shown in the figure and R is their resultant as per the triangle law. Uh, now you can uh, see all the dimensions shown here. So the X that we had in the earlier figure is now 10 cos 60 that's 5 and the Y from the earlier figure is 10 sine 60 that's 5 root 3. So R square will be 10 plus 5 whole square plus 5 root 3 whole square and that's 10 root 3 Newton. Uh, R has a magnitude 10 root 3 Newton and tan epsilon will be Y by A plus X, right? So Y is 5 root 3, A plus X is 15 and that's 1 by root 3. So tan epsilon is 1 by root 3 and therefore epsilon will be 30 degrees. Uh, <clears throat> mind you, we, we do have... Uh, uh, a simple value here, we are getting 1 by root 3, so we know the angle is uh, 30 degrees. It may not always be the case, we may have some, uh, you know, fractional value which you do not recognize. And in those cases, what you do is uh, you look at the trigonometric tables or uh, perhaps you can use a calculator, scientific calculator to determine the angle. Uh, <clears throat> now, this brings us to another aspect of vector addition and that's the polygon law of vector addition. Now vectors do not just come in pairs to be added so they, they, you, you can actually end up having problems where you have to add three, four, five, six, seven or eight vectors and in those cases uh, what you use is the polygon law of vectors. Now imagine that there is a displacement vector A and then there is a displacement vector B. The vector drawn from the tail of A to the head of B is vector A plus B. After this there is another displacement that's vector C there and uh, when vector C is added to vector A plus B we get the vector A plus B plus C there and when we add vector D to vector A plus B plus C we get the vector A plus B plus C plus D. Uh, this results in a polygon uh, that we have formed and this polygon has uh, a vector A plus B plus C plus D drawn in black there. That's your resultant of those four uh, vectors A, B, C and D. So if, if you arrange vectors in this manner, the, the tail of B starts at the head of A, then the tail of C starts at the head of B and the tail of D starts at the head of C then the vector drawn from the tail of A to the head of D represents A plus B plus C plus D. So that's the simple addition uh, when you have a larger number of vectors 
Now, the most important thing, we do not actually use this kind of geometric process of adding vectors in physics. Uh, that's not what we generally do. That's an inefficient, long calculation kind of a process. What we really do is something else altogether, and that's what uh, we will now be discussing. Uh, <coughs> we will first uh, learn, and uh, you can see, you know, in that figure, uh, in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. I have a good look at that uh, figure down there uh, with the x and y axes uh, shown in green and a vector a uh, drawn at an angle theta to the x axis direction. Now <clears throat> what we do is from the head of a we drop a perpendicular onto the x axis and then I draw two vectors one along the x-axis, that's the one that I have drawn there as ax i cap, and the other along the y-axis direction ay j cap, which is the length of that perpendicular, uh, which we drew from uh, the head of A to the x-axis. So <clears throat> what you can see is uh, I have represented vector A there, and also what I have shown is uh, two vectors, one is AX I cap, which is along the X axis direction, and the other one is AY J cap. Now in this figure, you can easily make out that vector A is the vector sum of vectors AX I cap and AY J cap. Can you see that? Vector A is the vector sum of AX I cap and a y j cap as per our triangle law of vector addition. So <clears throat> these two vectors a x i cap and a y j cap they're called the components of vector a and uh, it's quite easy to see that magnitude of uh, a x i cap which is a x when divided by a gives me cos theta so a x the x direction component, x direction part of vector A is A cos theta. What we are really doing now is we, have resol we are resolving the vector into parts. We are breaking it up into parts. Uh, that's the process we are going through. So vector A is made up of these two vectors, Ax i cap and Ay j cap. We choose to call them parts of vector A or you know, instead of calling them parts, we generally call them components, which is really the same thing. So Ax i cap and Ay j cap are parts or components of vector A. When we divide Ax by A, we get cos theta and therefore Ax, the magnitude of Ax i cap, Ax equals A cos theta. Similarly, you can uh, calculate Ay uh, as well. Now, the rule we arrive at for calculating the component of a vector in a certain direction is very simple. Now, if you are calculating the component of vector A along x-axis direction, as in this case, now the vector has a magnitude A and the uh, vector A makes an angle theta with the direction of x-axis. Therefore, the component of the vector along the x-axis direction will have a magnitude which equals the product of the magnitude of vector A with the cosine of the angle theta between the vector and the direction in which we are calculating the component. Now, that rule is uh, very clearly written down there on the screen. Uh, you can pause the screen and please make sure you write this down and uh, internalize it in your memory. This is perhaps the one thing that you will be doing most in physics. Uh, calculating components of vectors is something you do more than absolutely anything else in physics. So uh, this is something you're gonna, gonna be doing very, very frequently. So please internalize this to your memory. Now what we do is we represent our vector A as the sum of two vectors, Ax i cap and Ay j cap. And now, we have represented our vector A in what we call the analytical form of vector expression. Now, now why do we represent vectors in this uh, interesting analytical form? Uh, 
It offers enormous advantages when we are adding and subtracting vectors, as will become clear now. Uh, <clears throat> let's consider uh, this uh, couple of vectors A and B right below me here. Uh, we have a vector A and then there's a vector B and we have their resultant C, which is drawn from the tail of A to the head of B. By drawing, dropping perpendiculars from the heads of these vectors, I've also uh, shown to you the x components of vectors A and B. Can you see those? Uh, you, you can see those as Ax i cap and uh, Bx i cap, right? So you can see Ax i cap and Bx i cap down there. And also you can see the x component of vector C uh, on top of this, this uh, figure here. Uh, that's Cx that I have drawn there, right? Now, do you notice that Cx equals Ax plus Bx, right? Cx is equal to Ax plus Bx. And therefore, when you're adding vectors in the analytical form, when you add their x components, you get the x component of the resultant. When you add their y components, you get the resultant of the y component. And when you add their z components, you get the z component of the resultant as well. Of course, uh, the example uh, shown here is a two-dimensional example, but it, it, this exact same thing works in uh, 3D as well. So. If we have two vectors, Ax i cap plus Ay j cap and Bx i cap plus Bj j cap, their vector sum uh, will be simply Ax plus Bx times i cap plus Ay plus Bj times j cap, which uh, makes your vector addition a significantly easier process. Now, uh, <coughs> moving on, uh, uh, continuing with this uh, analytical uh, form uh, still uh, just a quick look at the analytical form of vector uh, expression again the same vector a uh, I have drawn uh, you know on my right here I've also drawn there uh, the x and y components ax i cap and ay j cap as well uh, and I have shown the angle theta which the vector makes with the positive direction of x axis here now just very quickly Calculating the magnitude of a vector from the analytical form, uh, you can see using the law, the Pythagoras uh, Pythagoras's theorem, that the magnitude of vector a will be simply root of a x squared plus a y squared. Those lengths, uh, that's the magnitude of uh, a, and the tan of the angle theta, which the vector makes with the the x axis, can be expressed as a y by a x. Very simple. There, uh, this is something we we do very very often as well. And therefore, please make sure you remember this. Uh, more often than not, we end up dealing with two-dimensional uh, problems and therefore this is what uh, works fairly well for us. Now, let's extend this logic to three dimensions as well. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, you know, the bottom right-hand corner of, of your screen, I have uh, shown all three axes, x, y, and z with the vector a, making an angle alpha with x axis, beta with y axis, and gamma with the z axis. Now the x, y, and z components, ax, ay, and az, will be a cos alpha, a cos beta, and a cos uh, gamma there, uh, right to my right. And uh, the vector can now be represented as Ax i cap plus Ay j cap plus Az k cap. Uh, the magnitude of this vector will be uh, under root of Ax square plus Ay square plus Az square. That's your Pythagoras' theorem for three dimensions. Uh, that's an easily uh, extended logic there from 2D to 3D. Uh, also, if you need to calculate the cosines of the angles alpha, beta, and uh, gamma, well, cos alpha will be simply Ax by the magnitude of A, which we've calculated. And similarly, cos beta will be Ay by the magnitude of A, and so on. Now, <clears throat> when your vectors are given 
to you in this analytical form. The addition, as I said, is very, very simple. And you can see an example of this kind of calculation right underneath me. Uh, you have a vector A and a vector B given uh, in analytical form. And when we add them up, uh, the X comp components are simply added algebraically to give the X component of the resultant. Y components are added algebraically to give the Y component of the resultant and the Z components are added algebraically to give the Z component of the resultant. So brilliant process, very simple process for adding up vectors. And now the last bit of this uh, particular video and that's subtracting vectors. Now subtraction of vectors is really nothing uh, new to learn because subtraction is simply addition of negative you know like for instance uh, 10 minus 4 is 10 plus minus of 4 and that's exactly how uh, vector subtraction works as well so a minus b is vector a plus minus of b now in the figure on my right we had two vectors a and b with the angle theta between them and in the in the figure below that i have drawn the vector minus b which is exactly same in magnitude as b but in the exact opposite direction now the angle between vectors a and minus b will be pi minus theta unlike the vectors a and b with, between which the angle was uh, theta the angle between a and minus b is pi minus theta and the vector drawn from the tail of a to the head of minus b is a plus minus of b which is a minus b that's the vector drawn in blue color there uh, so <clears throat> this exact same process as vector addition then and if you are given vectors in the analytical form uh, and you're subtracting vector b from vector a then you subtract the components of vector b from the components of vector a so if vectors are given in uh, numeric form in, in analytical form uh, you can uh, see that right underneath me if you have two vectors a and b the x component of a minus b is the x component of a minus the x component of b and similarly it works in exactly the same way for the y components and the z uh, components as well so that's how you subtract vectors And, you know, that brings me pretty much to the end of this video. Please do try and understand that this may perhaps be the most important lesson in physics. Vectors and their addition, their subtraction are two things that you do most frequently in physics and this is where a lot of mistakes get made as well so please make sure that you perfectly master the concepts the ideas of vector addition vector subtraction also the resolution of vectors uh, things that we have learned in this video extremely extremely important uh, perhaps the single most important uh, lesson in physics that you will perhaps ever really learn so make sure you have watched this video a fairly large number of times and also uh, do not forget to like share and subscribe uh, the video also give me your feedback on how this new format of videos is working thank you very much for watching uh, have fun enjoy your physics